All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Justin Sandifer. Uh, I'm a senior fellow and co-director of our education program here at the Center for Global Development. Um, and we really appreciate everybody tuning in today. We have, I think, an exciting event lined up for you with uh, some of the leading researchers and leading practitioners, actually, uh, trying to remedy low learning levels in school systems around the world. Um, and they're gonna be headlined by a report from our colleagues at RTI. Um, and we're here with uh, sponsorship from our, our friends at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so the motivation I think for this event uh, sort of needs no explanation for most of you. Um, we can all sort of recite statistics about the kind of so-called global learning crisis. Um, the one that sticks in my head is always that in half of the countries for which USAID produces demographic and health surveys, um, that's like 50 countries, um, more than half of women who completed five years of schooling still can't read a single sentence. So what we have is this like very broad and very deep kind of crisis and this phenomenon of kids going to school, going to several years of primary schooling and still not managing to grasp the basics of literacy. I think what's intellectually frustrating about this problem, frustrating but also interesting and challenging, is that of course teaching kids how to read is sort of a solved problem uh, technologically. You know, my kids go to a school, you know, in Washington D.C. down the street here, and they've learned how to read, and that school knows how to teach them to read. But it's not just here in D.C.P.S. We have this vast literature now of effective interventions, proven techniques to improve learning levels in low and middle income countries as well, including in some very challenging environments. But I think sort of the trajectory of the literature on impact evaluation in the development industry as a whole, is that as we've gotten more serious about rigorous evaluation in the last couple of decades and measuring impacts, taking these evaluations seriously, we found a lot of stuff that works, um, but we've also found a lot of stuff that doesn't replicate and scale very well. Um, to the point that it's become a little bit of a mantra, some of you will have followed along on social media over the last couple of weeks where there's been this discussion that you know nothing scales. Everything that we do that seems to work in pilot RCTs seems to fall apart when we take it to scale. And that's true sometimes in learning programs as well as in other sectors. And it can lead to a little bit of nihilism about is any of this you know, for any point if we can never make it work at scale. Well, today, I think we're gonna fight back against that nihilism with, uh, with a set of eight programs that sort of broke through that tendency for things to fall apart and managed to produce impressive learning gains at large scale. Um, I think this is one of the most important agendas in global education right now, um, finding not just what works, but what works at scale and what's sustainable and what we can actually do to move the needle um, for millions of kids um, who aren't learning to read otherwise. Uh, so I'm excited to hear from our full set of panelists, and I'm going to let Rita Paracas, our Associate Director here for Education at CGD, introduce the full panel. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us, and over to you, Rita. Thanks, Justin. Um, as Justin said, I'm Rita, Assistant Director of the Education Program at CGD. So thanks to everyone for joining us today for this discussion about the Learning at Scale study by RTI. And as Justin has said, the study has taken a really in-depth look at programs that have actually achieved successful reading outcomes at scale in order to determine what's made them successful. So for today, we'll first hear from RTI, a presentation of the findings of their recent uh, report, the interim report that's just been published. And then I'll introduce the panelists for today. So we have with us representatives of four of the eight programs that RTI have highlighted in their report. Uh, I do want to note that there will be future webinars where all the programs will be featured. Uh, once we hear a bit more about these programs from the four panelists, we'll hear from Laura Savage, our discussant today, who's also been a member of the Learning at Scale Advisory Group, and we'll save some time at the end for all of your questions. Um, so please do uh, go ahead and send those questions to us either via YouTube, uh, emailing events at cgdev.org or tweeting at us. And uh, please introduce yourself in your written questions if you'd like to, and we'll try to get to as many of those uh, questions as possible. So first I'd like to introduce uh, three of the authors of the Learning at Scale report. Um, so today we have with us Jonathan Stern, who's a senior researcher for education and evaluation at RTI. Uh, Matthew Jukes is a fellow 
for Education and Evaluation at RTI. And Ben Piper is the new incoming Director of Global Education at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, well known in our sector for his work previously at RTI. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to the RTI team uh, for their presentation. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rita. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen here and uh, we'll get this going. Um, Perfect. Hopefully people are seeing the correct screen. Just a no. Excellent. Um, so uh, I'm sure that everyone who's attending this webinar today has already uh, read the 200 plus page uh, interim report that we uh, sent a link out to with the invite last week. But for those of you who haven't, uh, we'll just make sure to give a brief overview of the study here. Um, and a bit of background first um, and then highlighting the findings that we uh, that we think are most essential to, to be discussing in this forum. So um, the Learning at Scale activity, for those of you who are not familiar, <clears throat> it's uh, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We began this work in 2019. Um, and as Justin noted, the real purpose of this was to figure out what were those programs that were uh, finding success at scale. Um, Matthew will talk in a little bit about some of those criteria and, and the selection process, but the, that's the, the general big picture of kind of where the impetus for this uh, study came from. The original intention was to have data uh, fully completed for all of these uh, data collections completed for all these programs uh, last year. Uh, COVID unsurprisingly had an impact on that but we didn't wanna wait any longer to get this information out there. So that's why we are now holding this event. Um, but we will be talking about this, uh, mentioning several times that it is an interim report. Um, we have full data collected from some programs um, and less uh, data collected from some of the others. So some of these findings are, um, are preliminary results that we, we are seeing coming out of the data thus far. Um, but we will be continuing to refine them uh, as we move forward and as we continue to, to finalize our data collections for, for the remainder of the studies. Um, and as Rena noted, we will, in addition to this event, um, be having three more events in the coming months that will actually highlight um, additional uh, programs that are involved in this study and will focus more on uh, each of the research questions uh, in depth. Um, so today is Kind of the large overview and we'll get into the the policy focus on uh, instructional practice instructional supports and system supports um, in the three ensuing webinars um, so just very quickly um, as a highlight to start um, some of the main things that we found while working through this in the in the past two years uh, the first, which was something that, you know, Justin noted the importance of this work in, in general, is that we actually found that it is possible to substantially improve learning outcomes at scale working within government systems, right? That genuinely is a question <laughs> that we're grappling with, and it was nice to find that there were eight programs that we could even study for this. Um, although Matthew will talk about how many programs we sorted through in order to get down to the eight, and so it, it wasn't as easy as we may have hoped to find those programs, but we did find programs that were able to, uh, to see success at large scale. Um, a second is that there's evidence of multiple pathways to success, right? So each of these programs were doing slightly different things in their implementation approach. However, there were definite significant commonalities across. Um, part of that is related to uh, the funding organization for many of the programs, which Matthew will talk about a bit, but also part of it is uh, is just thinking about what works um, and continuing to to move forward with uh, with those approaches. Um, a third point is that working through government systems for all of these large scale programs was absolutely an essential component. Right, none of them wanted to create 
a parallel system and in order to work at large scale, it is going to be important to, uh, to work with and through governments. However, getting to that second stage, which we talk about a lot in this field on the institutionalization and sustainability piece that still does very much remain an elusive component, despite the significant you know, capacity building activities that, uh, that many of these programs implemented. Uh, and lastly, a lot of the recommendations that we highlight in the interim report and that we'll talk about today are focused directly on improved implementation as opposed to what I noted here as improved ideas, right? So, so a lot of this is really the idea of there is a literature out there on what good teaching practice is, where the rubber hits the road is how do you actually implement that well at scale? It's often less about coming up with new innovative ideas for how we can teach in the classroom. And in these programs, at least more about how they're able to uh, successfully implement and what they're doing in order to, uh, to see these successes as opposed to coming up with something uh, new and innovative that no one has done before. Um, and the reason we sort of say that is because sometimes when you look at these findings, you might look through and say, yeah, we already knew a lot of that, but that's sort of the point, right? That yes, we know that many of these things work, but the question is how can we get them to work well and work well at scale? Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Matthew to talk uh, a bit about the background uh, in, in more detail. Yeah, thanks Jonathan. And <clears throat> thanks Rita and Justin for the uh, introduction. Um, in fact, Justin, you, you did a great job of going through the slide pretty much um, in your introduction. I see this as a sort of chronology of what we've learned about improving um, early grade outcomes. Um, about 15 or so years ago, there's a proliferation of studies documenting low learning levels, and, and, and that remains the case in many low middle income countries today. Then lots of positive news from small scale interventions that were evaluated and shown to have positive effects, proving what um, the children at, 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 at Justin School already knew that, that there are proven technologies to teach reading and mathematics. Um, but then a concern that this was limited just to small scale studies and how do we replicate this at scale. Um, but then, you know, anecdotes and, and stories and evaluations coming out about larger scale programs that were successful. So we set out to identify and we found eight highly successful early grade programs that were working at scale. Um, and we collected new data and analyzed existing data to, um, to, to figure out essentially the ingredients for how they worked at, um, at the, the classroom level, the instructional strategies that worked and at the system level, what supported those classroom strategies. So um, we, uh, sent out a call, identified 60 organizations that were promising. Um, we had conversations with 52 of them um, uh, from a, a range of donors from you know, the World Bank, GPE, UNICEF, um, USAID and DFID as it was, um, and others. Uh, and we selected eight programs um, in the end with support from uh, an advisory group that uh, helped us um, have a bit of objectivity about this. Uh, we had a whole list of criteria, but the two that were hardest to meet were um, the, these two highlighted here, effectiveness and at scale. For effectiveness, we wanted evidence um, from a causal impact study uh, that the, 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 the program was effective. Um, and this, we feel, probably ended up um, pushing us towards a certain kind of program, particularly donor-funded programs were um, were more likely to have these um, rigorous evaluations than, say, programs um, led from within governments. Um, and we also wanted it to, to happen at scale. And scale, we talk about 500 schools, but it was also a conceptual thing that we wanted it to be um, administered uh, or implemented across um, whole administrative subdivisions. So we really wanted to examine um, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the system uh, within those subdivisions to understand how they supported implementation. So we wanted at least two subdivisions. Um, uh, and yeah, next slide. 
we ended up actually with eight uh, literacy programs um, or programs that, that included literacy. Some of them had numeracy as well. We're going to present uh, data from uh, complete sets of data from three programs. We, we were crisscrossing the world just before COVID struck and we managed to complete our data collections in um, with the Equip T program in Tanzania, with the uh, Tusome program in Kenya, and with the Room to Read Seri program in India. Um, and we collected systems data from the uh, Pakistan reading program. Uh, but we have uh, high level data, secondary data from, um, from the rest of our programs. Um, we had a second program in, in India, the Read India program, um, and NEI Plus in Nigeria. Ghana Learning and uh, Lecture Portus in, uh, in Senegal. Okay, and so um, we had three research questions at different levels. If we start from the classroom, um, we wanted to know about instructional practice. So what classroom ingredients, um, such as teaching practices or the classroom environment lead to learning and programs that are effective at scale. Then working backwards, we wanna know what support is given to those teachers to enable that effective instruction to happen. So what methods of training and support um, were given? And then finally, what system, is, system support is required to deliver um, that effective training um, that teachers receive and the support they receive um, that, that trickles down to effective classroom practice? So those were the three research questions. Um, we thought a lot about the methodology uh, for these programs. Um, the, many of the programs had already been implemented, so the, their randomized evaluations had already taken place. Um, and we were also working at the system level where we also had to be creative about um, how, how to demonstrate the things that we were documenting um, were not just things that the program had done, but, but were actually the things that were responsible for the program success. So, trying to understand an element of causality. So we combined several approaches. Um, the, uh, we collected classroom level quantitative data with a counterfactual. So we, that means we were able to compare with a quasi-experimental design where the teachers in the program schools were, um, uh, were behaving differently, implementing different strategies from those in control schools. Um, this is in countries that didn't have a complete national um, uh, rollout. Um, so we were able to find control groups. The second approach was what we're calling theory-based methods. So we mapped out the whole causal chain from the ministry um, to, to the districts, to, to coaches, to teachers, and to the classroom, um, and looked at all those steps and examined each one of those steps to see how um, it influenced the, the next uh, chain, the next part of the chain. Um, so we had qualitative interviews uh, with, um, with all the people involved in districts, teachers, and also quantitative descriptions um, uh, the, of uh, activities happening at all those levels. Um, we also have some uh, documentation of the programs um, to understand what their intended approach was and talk to the people involved to do a high level analysis, which is available actually for all eight of, of the programs, um, not just the three or four we were able to visit. And so there's a lot of primary data collection, 31 uh, new in instruments uh, implemented in total. And so the idea across these methods is that if, for example, all of the programs say that phonics is, is an essential component and the teachers we interview, the district officials we interview tell us that was the reason the program worked. And we observe high quality phonics instruction happening more in the program classrooms and the control across all of our countries, then we feel like we have a pretty strong evidence to say that is um, an influential component of what makes all of these uh, programs successful at scale. Um, and then I think I'm handing back to Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. That's fantastic. And I think two quick things I just wanted to make sure to emphasize on top of what Matthew said. One is on the scale component, although we did start with uh, 500 as our as our minimum criteria, um, we ended up 
with across the eight programs um, with between 3,000 up to about 25,000 schools. Uh, so they were all significantly larger than our than our minimum scale criteria. Um, and the other thing that that Matthew noted that I think is really important to highlight again is that these programs were selected based on rigorous evidence of impact prior to the work that we were doing, right? So we were not assessing the uh, or evaluating these programs, the impact of them on student performance. They were pre-selected based on evidence of impact. And we were then looking at, you know, what it is that they were doing uh, that we think is, is, driving, uh, is driving that. And, and that brings us to, you know, the, the findings that we'll go through uh, in the next through sl few slides here. Um, we'll go through these as aligned with the three research questions. So beginning with the instructional practice. Um, one of the things we noted was that six of the programs increased instructional time in the weekly timetable that was dedicated to reading, right? This is an essential piece in many systems where there is uh, relatively a uh, little time dedicated, having any additional amount of time uh, was was valuable for these programs to uh, to be successful. And we see in this slide here from th the three countries where we were able to collect um, the primary data that for all three programs, Equip-T, SERI, and SOME, um, that dark blue bar on the left side, um, which is the the reading component, um, this is the um, percentage of time spent on different areas um, of instruction in the classrooms that we observed. And that dark blue bar on the left shows that for all three programs, what the most time in these classrooms was spent on the reading component itself. Um, there was significant amount of time in some of these programs on uh, phonological awareness as well, that's the PA. So that um, bit of a precursor to, to reading instruction per se. But one of the important things is the, um, the lower amount of time actually spent on uh, oral language and on the management and nothing side uh, over on the right, um, but, but a large focus on, on reading explicitly in reading lessons. It may sound very obvious, but it is something important uh, to note the, uh, the amount of time dedicated to it. Um, we also saw that these programs all focused on showing the relationship between sounds and letters, right? So shifting away from the more traditional whole language approach to include a phonics component. Um, it didn't always mean that it was a explicitly phonics-based instruction only, but having a phonics component in a balanced approach to literacy. Um, and when we asked teachers what part of their instruction had the biggest impact on student learning, um, we found that a combination of more focus on letters, sounds, or blending um, and the new methodology or instructional approach, which was very much tied to uh, this, this phonics-based initiative um, across uh, Seri, Tosome, and Equip-T were the, were the main drivers uh, in teachers' minds behind what it was that was impacting uh, student learning. Um, we also had a teacher in the Seri program um, tell us that it's based on sounds because of that even writing gets easier. First they learn the sounds, then they learn the writing part. The quote continued to, to go on to talk about how much the, uh, the focus on phonics was essential for, for learning other skills uh, as the students went on. A third uh, instructional practice finding is the use of systematic and explicit direct instruction. Um, this is very common across the programs, often paired with structures te structured teacher's guides, which we'll talk about uh, in the instructional supports section. Um, and six of the programs were using a gradual release model, so the I do, we do, you do approach. Um, and if you look at this slide here, um, this is the number of programs across the eight uh, that included a, uh, each of these components in their implementation is the dark blue bar at the top of each line. Um, the lighter blue bar below is if the program noted that that 
component was key to the project implementation and success. Um, and so you can see here that uh, all eight had a phonics-based instruction component, seven had a direct instruction component, and at least half of the programs noted that those two things were essential um, for the success of the program and were a key uh, component of their implementation. Um, sorry, uh, let me just run back quickly on that. I apologize. Um, so the fourth finding um, that we had for the instructional practice um, is just the idea that seeing evidence of uh, improvement in engagement in the classroom led to improved teacher confidence as well. And, and this was done in a number of ways, but one of them was variation in instructional strategies, um, which then led to uh, improved engagement. Um, and we had a teacher or a meeting facilitator in the Equip T program uh, tell us that students now do better and therefore teachers are proud of the ability to deliver the, the Equip T program. And initially teachers weren't keen to teach uh, standards one to four, classes are too big, they didn't know how to make aids and such, um, but now they're confident. This was a common theme that we uh, heard from teachers, coaches, and meeting facilitators across programs that the increased confidence um, also led teachers to, uh, to implement more fully uh, in the classroom. Um, Sorry, I, for some reason, have uh, an issue with that um, going back to the correct slide. I apologize. Um, so moving on to the instructional support findings, um, trainings uh, for all of these programs, as well as coaching and communities of practice, uh, really focus a lot on giving teachers more opportunities to practice and rehearse the skills that they were learning as a part of the program. Um, this is an essential piece of uh, the programming. Trainings also tended to be shorter and more skill-based as well as at a lower level of the system um, than, than teachers had noted uh, prior um, trainings had been. Um, and in terms of the modeling and practice piece, uh, you see here that, um, excuse me, you see here that the uh, teacher training emphasizes modeling and practice. This third line was true of all eight programs, um, and seven of them noted that that was a, a key to their, uh, to their implementation. Um, we also, when, <clears throat> excuse me, asking uh, teachers about what activities occurred more frequently during program trainings than prior trainings that they had attended. Uh, you see that the, the largest uh, increases were on discussion, modeling, and small group practice. Um, these were three things that were uh, significantly increased uh, during program trainings relative to, uh, to prior trainings. Um, and there's a coach from a, the SERI program that talks about the importance of um, demonstration and involvement of, of teachers um, being able to, to practice uh, as every day of the training moved along. Um, structured teacher's guides um, simplified the instructional practice, uh, process and built confidence. Six of the programs um, noted that this was key to their implementation. Um, these structured guides were, uh, were also um, included, but one of my favorite quotes, I think, that we, um, that we include in the report was uh, from a teacher in the SERI program that said, uh, with the teacher guide, all the problems went away. That may be um, a bit uh, of an overstatement, but it just shows the importance of the teacher's guide in the minds of these teachers who are learning new instructional approaches, um, having to uh, employ new practices in the classroom, but having something that can guide them through was really valuable for them feeling confident in their ability to, uh, to learn the new approaches and skills. Um, programs focus on positive and collaborative teacher support. Uh, this is another shift from more traditional approaches. 
Um, we typically see a lot of inspection and supervision in the mindset of, of uh, teacher support staff. Um, so all of the programs really focused heavily on um, a positive and collaborative uh, support for teachers, which was noted by teachers themselves, as well as by coaches and community of practice meeting facilitators who all discussed uh, the importance of that collaboration and the positive aspect of their, their work together. Um, and lastly, on the support side, the improved books. Um, so both having access to books in the classroom was an essential piece in and of itself for students. Also having those books related to the curriculum and the teacher's guides that were being used and lastly, we had a lot of uh, people talking about difficult um, for children to learn from. Students were not very interested before. Now they're interested. They have techniques for sounds. Blending are very effective. A Tosome teacher talked about them enjoying the stories very much. The pictures are real. It brings their interest. Um, it was, once again, common uh, for, for people to discuss the importance of uh, having books that, that children wanted to read and learn from in the classroom. Uh, lastly, we move to the system support side of things. Uh, one of the most essential pieces was aligning the program priorities with existing government plans, right? This often meant beginning with evidence of uh, a need for the program in the first place. We had uh, in each of these programs, it was not uncommon for the government to ask why they were only focusing on reading if it was only a reading program, for example, um, but showing evidence of poor performance or evidence of a pilot program as to why this approach was successful was, uh, was generally key. Um, and alignment was, was essential for, uh, for buy-in from ministries, particularly when you have uh, you know, shifting government leadership and ministries in the first place, aligning with government plans and priorities is. Uh, is an important uh, undertaking. Um, all programs invested in ministry capacity building um, and the delivery of services. Um, and while ministry staff noted the importance of this, um, this may not be sufficient for uh, sustainability in the long term, despite the strong efforts of these programs. You do see that as uh, programs come to a close, even if there's interest in continuing many of these components, um, there's often a difficulty either in capacity or funding, unsurprisingly. Um, you often see that if things are continued, they're continued in the part, uh, the area where the program was implemented and not expanded to, to new geographical areas. Um, regular program and government monitoring uh, was essential, although implementation monitoring tended to remain a program responsibility in most of these programs. Um, they, even when using government staff as, uh, as the uh, supervisors or coaches, um, it still often relied on uh, additional input and oversight from the program uh, in order for that system to, to work as effectively as intended. Um, and lastly, you know, mapping out a transfer of responsibility was a, was a key component of these programs, which led to all of them institutionalizing at least some components um, and none uh, were able to institutionalize all of them whether or not that's even uh, an intended focus. Um, but the idea here is the importance of all of these uh, components working through and with the government as much as possible to transition some of these uh, components moving forward. Although the, the institutionalization and uh, sustainability piece, I think um, are, are still requiring a fair amount of work to be done in the future. Uh, lastly, just as a, a little note for, uh, for what's coming next. So we have um, findings briefs that highlight each of these uh, three research questions and the findings and implications of them. And we'll have policy-focused webinars on those as we noted earlier. We have a few data collections left to complete uh, after which we'll update um, the report and have country level dissemination events. Um, and then uh, lastly, we are, working toward um, a new 
uh, initiative as well on this, um, focused on uh, COVID response and specifically on numeracy as well. Um, if anyone has ideas, we'll be putting out a call for programs in the near future, but um, feel free to, to email us if you, if you have thoughts. Um, I'm going to end the slideshow here, but turn over for a moment to, uh, to Ben to, uh, to give some additional remarks. Thanks so much, Jonathan, and uh, greetings, everyone, from Nairobi. Um, it's worth noting verbally, as well as we've done in the report and in the, in the PowerPoint, that one of the programs that were selected for Learning at Scale was a program implemented by our RTI, and I actually personally had a role on that, so it's worth just everyone knowing that there was a, both the research side and implementation side overlap. Um, I have three things to say briefly, uh, and then we'll go to the, the rest of the program. This is the first one. What are we not telling you? <laughs> we are not saying that utilizing these elements of programs that uh, Jonathan and Matthew just walked through means that any new program that uses those elements will definitely work. <laughs> and in fact, I think uh, the comment earlier about the importance of quality implementation and the focus of the system on the implementation of those elements was essential for all of these programs to differentiate themselves from previous programs. It really can't be lip service to those elements. Just having phonics or just having training focused on practice, that's not enough. It's a system level, system-wide focus on implementation quality that differentiated these eight programs from others. And we're also not saying that these are the only eight large-scale programs that improve learning. In fact, we had to cut, we had to put the line somewhere. It happened to be at eight. Uh, and in fact, I bet there are other large scale programs that don't, that weren't included, but probably because they didn't have learning outcomes data. And I think that's one of the recommendations we have in a report about including more evidence, even if it's a government only program for the policymakers on, on the call. How are you tracking evidence of impact of your programs? How will we know that this is a, a model program that other countries should consider? Second point is that it looks like progress is positive. I wonder for those of you who've been working in this field for a while, 10 years ago, if we did learning at scale study, how many programs would have met this criteria? Practically 3,000 or more schools and rigorous evidence of impact. We might not have had any or just one or two. I think there's real evidence of what is working at scale and actually evidence of some growth. And it's also important to note, just to emphasize that it's fundamentally different to have these kind of programs working at scale, meaningful stay at scale, than to have lots of small things working at small scale. I'm, I'm one who have tried these small programs and have been quite proud of the, the outcomes that uh, government has done, but it's qualitatively fundamentally different than working at scale. Um, and so I, that's my last point, actually. It kind of goes to our recommendations in the report itself. This is the first one, to consider investing in these learning at scale large programs that have actually provided the possibility to respond to learning poverty, on the one hand, learning low learning outcomes, and potentially also the learning loss we've seen as a result of COVID-19. You might have seen there's a uh, Petrino's recent meta-analysis on learning loss uh, in, in a variety of countries. There's large impacts consistently, real reductions as a result of, uh, of COVID and time out of school, et cetera. Uh, and it's worth noting that there are lots of small scale uh, learning loss reduction strategies that have been attempted and we actually plan to research those. But the real point I want you to remember from me at this point at least is that these highly effective large scale programs and the ways that they implemented are amongst the very best options we have to respond to learning poverty in general, learning, low learning outcomes even before 2020, but also to the learning loss we've experienced since, since 2020. And as uh, Justin transitioned us at the beginning, improving these outcomes at scale is possible. And that maybe there's some evidence and some ideas that could be drawn from these eight highly effective programs going forward. And so the last comment I'd like to make is just to thank all of the research, all of the organizations and the countries that we, we were able to research. This isn't, uh, this was a pretty in-depth effort. So uh, for all of these programs and implementers and governments and donors who provided access to data and to the classrooms that matter the most, we appreciate that and uh, look forward to talking with you more today about what we can draw from these programs as well as these next sessions going forward. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks to all of you. I'm sure you've sparked a lot of questions and comments. So please, to the audience, please keep those coming in. Uh, for all the details on these eight programs, do check out that 200 plus page report that Jonathan mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we've included a link on YouTube. Uh, it's on online as well. Um, I will now turn to our panelists. I'll, I'd like to introduce our four panelists today. Um, we have Betty Temeng 
Mensa Bonsu. She is a senior reading advisor with the Ghana Learning Program. Nuruddin Lawal is chief of party with the NEI Plus Program in Nigeria. Deviani Prashad is head of international collaborations at Pratham, representing the Read India Program. And we have Ablai Niang, senior reading and pedagogical advisor uh, with the program Lecture Produce in Senegal. Um, so Ablai, I'm going to come to you last. We have a simultaneous French uh, interpretation going on. We had some audio issue at the beginning, so hopefully that is resolved. But I'll I'll allow I'll allow the other three speakers to to go first, and then if if uh, your audio issues are resolved, Ablai will come to you. Um, meanwhile, please do uh, stay muted if you're not speaking. Um, so I have just two questions that I'll pose to all of our panelists. Um, please do mute if, if not speaking until I come to you. Um, so we just like to hear a bit more about their programs, their experiences working on them, the key program features um, that, that contributed to the program's success. And so we have just heard from RTI quite a bit about the specific approaches and practices that have contributed to these program success. So I'd like to add, uh, ask you all the panelists, of all the features of your programs, which would you say contributed most to improving learning outcomes? So please keep your responses brief. And first I will turn to Betty. Thank you so much for the question. I'd like to say uh, I'm really excited to be here to talk about the, how learning has improved uh, uh, outcomes in Ghana and also to say good morning, good afternoon and good evening for all those joining us today. I think I'm really excited to be part of this. Now to the first question uh, on program approach and what features we think most contributed to improve learning outcomes. I think for learning, uh, to start with, uh, our theory of change has been that if we have materials, training and coaching, along with continuous monitoring for teachers, this will lead uh, to the teachers being exposed to in instructional changes. And with the teachers continuously applying these new instru instructional changes, we should see improvement in learning outcomes. And I think that is what we've done uh, uh, throughout the whole of the learning activity. So if we're looking at the components of the um, uh, theory of change. The first one is the instructional approach, which uh, is the systematic way of teaching reading from the learning of the letter sounds to comprehension. And this is achieved by explicit instruction uh, before any learning outcomes uh, will be achieved. And then also the dose. Uh, for our program, we have an hour every day uh, for literacy. And that has also made a lot of difference to how uh, children are learning in the classroom and, and the outcomes as well. The second one is materials. Uh, our teaching and learning materials are uh, locally developed and our emphasis are on content relevant teaching and learning materials where children can really relate to. And this has really helped children to enjoy uh, reading and participating in lessons because they can relate to what is going on in the classroom. We have teacher guides, and we have a pupil book, which every child has got their own copy. So they're able to really participate fully in uh, activities in the classroom. And then we have trainings, uh, trainings on how to use the materials. And this is not just one of training. We have regular refresher trainings. Every single term, the teachers go for refresher, and this really has helped us to really provide the support that teachers need in the classroom. And we, we have used feedback from the field, from visits, feedback from uh, the dashboard that we have uh, to identify areas that the teachers are really struggling in. 
So we base our refreshers based on those activities that really help teachers to improve in their delivery. And then we have uh, continuous teacher support and monitoring and then coaching. So for teachers, that also made a lot of difference because regularly they had the support in the school. Somebody was there to really help them to solve problems and then they were being monitored consistently. So that also contributed to the uptake of the whole program. Teachers became very comfortable and really loved uh, the, how the, the whole approach helped them to improve in their teaching. And then finally, we have the system take up. We've heard a lot about it. Uh, this goes straight into the second question. But that really made a lot of difference into uh, how our, our program, we believe, will be sustained. So we can go straight into it or we can pause for some questions. Should I go straight into it, Rita? You know, Betty, if you want to just take a brief moment on what helped your program to scale, I think you're, you're taking the right approach. We're a little bit uh, behind schedule. I want to leave time for audience member questions. So maybe we'll just hear from each of the panelists one time on two questions. So one, just really pulling out the key features that improve learning for your program. And then the second feature, uh, second question is how did you work with government? How did you get buy-in and what allowed this program to scale? So I'm going to ask the panelists to hit those two questions. Um, Betty, you've told us, uh, you've given us some color on the, the specific features that improve learning. If you'd like to add something about the question of scalability uh, in Ghana, uh, please do that now. And then I'll turn to the other panelists. Yes. So thank you so much. Uh, to the second question on scalability and how we're able to get the buy-in and support from the government uh, to scale up the program. I think by design, learning from the onset in 2014, we intentionally and systematically used co-creation strategies to engage the Ministry of Education and Ghana Education Service to own and lead the learning activity. And it, that happened in several different ways and different levels under the management and operations of uh, the learning uh, project. So I will break it down a little. So if we look at the engagement, uh, how we engage the system, it in included introductory meetings held at the national level to adore the program. So every time there is a, we, we're doing something different, we, do, we have a national event where we really outdoor and we included all the system actors to really help us uh, outdoor the activity. We have joint planning uh, meetings as well where we convene with key actors in Ghana, the Ministry of Education, universities and other institutions to develop their priorities that should inform the work plan for learning. So all the system actors are involved right at the beginning during the planning uh, of the activities that we, we deem priority. Now we also have district and regional directors introduction workshop, which we also from the national level, we drill down to the districts and the regions to also introduce the program to them. Uh, this also includes the deputies and the uh, public relations officers. And then we get them to commit uh, from the educational sectors on how they could support the pro program. We also uh, co-located to the regional offices where we really started uh, the program. The regional directors donated offices for us for free. So we were really close to the regional office where we had regular interactions with them, we brainstormed issues. There were regular meetings uh, that we brief the regional director as to what is happening at any time. They were 100% involved in all the decisions that went on. We had quarterly, meet, quarterly meetings with also the regional and district directors and, and to really discuss progress on implementation and emerging issues. And then we all find uh, solutions and then way forward 
uh, the regional and district directors also have quarterly monitoring visits where they visit their schools, we give them tablets. So they go monitor what's going on, uh, check some of pupils' performance, and then they will feed it into our dashboard so we know exactly which school is performing, which one is struggling. And then in all of activities too, the uh, Ministry of Education or the Director General is the one who endorses our invitation letters. They put you on the letter heads and go. So straight on, all activities uh, are endorsed and then approved, and then they send the letters to go out, uh, including teaching and um, all trainings we're doing. Uh, so as a result, majority of our activities are led by the Ghana Education Service and the Ministry uh, as well. And then working through the government system, capacity building has been spoken about. I think we've done that a lot in the system. Uh, we have trained national, 120 national call trainers. We have trained over 800 district support uh, trainers. And then we have worked very closely with the National Teaching Council, National Curriculum for uh, National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, and, and build their capacity as well. All the activities we do, we try to involve uh, some of these actors. And then our material development as well, all the writers, illustrators, and des designers were Ghanaians, local people. So that has, we have a lot of capacity in the system for anybody who wants to use them in the future uh, for any scale up. And now educational management as well at the school level, as I've said before, the districts and the national and the regions, we are all in there uh, making sure that activities are going on in the schools as expected. So regular monitoring by them as well. Now we have the monitoring evaluation fidelity of implementation data management system, which was developed uh, uh, we support or it was led by the Ghana Education Service people with our support. So they have also a firm grasp of how to use uh, the FOI system to really monitor implementation. And this is used, the data collected is used uh, for decision making. We have now an oversight steering committee who will go on the dashboard to really find out what's going on. We have the district education directors, we have the school improvement support officers who go and collect the data and feed it into their system. So uh, with all this happening, in, the, in our absence in the future, we hope and we believe that there's a higher probability of the system continue to sustain and the gains from the learning activity. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Betty. It's, it's very encouraging to hear how much involvement there was at the system level. Uh, I'll turn to Nuruddin now from NEI Plus in Nigeria. So anything you'd like to highlight, Nuruddin, on either of these two questions, what contributed most to improving learning and how did you work with government to scale this program? Um, thank you very much, um, Rita. And I would like to say hello to everyone also, regardless of where you are listening from, you're welcome. Um, I think the NEI Plus project is quite unique because uh, it's a partly system strengthening program and emphasized that uh, we are supposed to support uh, government systems to strengthen their capacity to develop and improve reading outcomes. And so all that we did uh, is captured as a system strengthening uh, from the system strengthening approach. Um, I would like to say that based on that, um, it has an element of um, CLA, which is collaborative learning adaptive approach. Uh, which we ran together very closely uh, with USAID and also with the government partners uh, that we worked with at every level of the project. Um, one very important aspect of the project that I need to mention that uh, 
I don't want to duplicate things that have been said uh, because other projects are very similar, is that we're able to increase the time on task, uh, double it from 650 hours to 1,350 hours uh, per year. And that uh, has a big influence on what kind of material we develop. And like other projects, uh, we are able to develop a scripted mother tongue based uh, TLMs, teaching learning materials for pupils and for teachers, which is also phonics based. One additional part that are really important was the pre-service aspect of the, of the activity that we're able to have an aspect of this activity by introducing reading into the curriculum of colleges of education in Nigeria. I will come to that on the um, system strengthening and sustainability also. Um, other aspects include the coaching and mentoring using tablet based and also working with the community members, specifically mothers association and community coalitions to support children uh, at home. Um, one very important aspect of this that I, I want to emphasize also is the teaching learning materials. For me, it forms the core of almost everything that we did because it's, in, it's there that we have the phonics approach, it's there that we have the scripted lesson, it determines uh, the interactivity that children were able to have even when in school and when out of school. And if you look at it, one of the greatest problem around reading is children having books to read. If they don't have books to read, they cannot uh, be able to learn how to read. Um, a figure says like 5.6% of children uh, only have book, three books at home to read as of 2016. And this is a recurrent cost for government because of, it has a very uh, big implication for government costs. Uh, if you think about a context of like Nigeria, where we have more than 20 million children uh, in school at that level, and the project covers, was able to reach more than a million children uh, on the project, and we're able to distribute more than 10 million books over that period. That is quite massive. And each state will have to do that and so what we try to do, I'm going into sustainability now, is to ensure that the states we work with have this um, reading activity um, reflecting in their MTSS, which is the medium term sector strategy of the state with a particular charge code, which means that year in year out, they can budget uh, for the reading activities, which include the coaching and mentoring, the material production, uh, the teacher training activities in schools. Um, I also like to say that the quality of the books that were produced were quite very, meet the best practices you can find anywhere. And the quality of the print in terms of uh, the pictures there, the, the quality of the books and all of that. One very important thing I need to mention on the sustainability is that uh, because of the approach with government, we have a situation whereby even before we uh, got into two years into the project, we have a system whereby we covered 10 local government in the state and the government was able to carry along the remaining 10 local government because of the budget approach and because of the uh, improved uh, learning outcomes that has been noticed in a short while. In the other state, we were working in 10 and they moved into 13. Uh, this gave other partners confidence to also replicate in places where they work. So UNICEF was able to take this over and World Bank uh, project was able to replicate activities in six more states that we work. And in addition to that, this success also encouraged USAID to also say that um, these materials were produced in Hausa, which is one of the main uh, major languages in Nigeria. And because of the success, uh, we can replicate this activity in other states, in other parts of the country. And so materials were also produced in Yoruba and, uh, and Igbo language uh, towards the end of the project. And this 
makes it a national program in a way. Very importantly, I said, I'm going to come back to uh, the sustainability. One part of it that we're able to do from the beginning is to ensure that there was this um, training that was high level, uh, a postgraduate program that was done for more than uh, about 60 um, pre-service specialists who were um, certificated in early grade reading at that high level. And then we work with colleges of education and with the government partners who we also train over the period of this period of this project to ensure that they can be able to replicate. Now, as we talk, these are the people that are going to the different states, especially the best states to train in those states and make sure that uh, the project activities are uh, continued. Um, one other thing is that the Universal Basic Education Commission that manages um, basic education in Nigeria also brought into the project and produced materials. So for me, uh, materials becomes very, very important in, uh, in ensuring that activities of the project uh, were highly uh, sustained. Thank you. Thank you, Nuruddin. Uh, we're definitely seeing some commonalities emerging across uh, the programs. And now let's hear from Deviani from the Read India program. Uh, anything else you'd like to add, Deviani, on how your program succeeded in improving learning uh, and also worked with government to reach scale? Yeah, thanks so much, Rita. And I think there are obviously a lot of overlaps um, with what we heard from Betty and Nuruddin. Uh, but one thing I'd like to say up front uh, for those of you who have not read the report, which I think is many of us uh, who are watching today, um, the Read India program is essentially the teaching at the right level work uh, led by Pratham in India. And the specific program uh, that was being looked at for the purpose of this report uh, is the work being scaled by the government of Karnataka, which is a state in the southern part of India, uh, on improving reading and math outcomes for children. Uh, so, of course, you know, it goes without saying that the classroom methodology or the very specific instructional methodology is a big contributor to the program. Uh, and, and that is the teaching at the right level approach in this context. Uh, but there are two other things that I would like to mention. Uh, the first is around data. Now, uh, you know, this is something that uh, is also been mentioned quite a bit uh, from our previous panelists. But what's I think interesting about uh, the Karnataka program and, on, and most teaching at the right level programs is that there is very simple measurement that is used to first understand the problem and then to track progress. And I think that has been very, very key um, in the government's approach to sort of building on the work that was happening in Odu Karnataka, which is this government led program uh, and seeing how things are progressing and taking action to make sure we uh, you know, achieve the outcomes, which are very, very large in the case of the Karnataka-led program uh, and also at scale. And the second part I'd like to mention is this sort of mentoring support and review structure that was built into the program. Uh, and it was really around this point that was made in the presentation about positive and collaborative support to teachers, right? But coming from within the system. So not by external or additional actors hired, but really coming from within the system. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, the last point is around system alignment, uh, and I'm happy to talk to that for a few seconds as well. I know we're very short on time, Rita, so I'll hand back to you quickly. I think uh, in the Karnataka um, case and, and the trajectory of a system-led TAL program may vary significantly from context to context. We've seen this in India going from state to state. And of course, we're seeing this internationally as well. But if you look at the Karnataka program, the first and very important step, this was mentioned during the presentation as well, was understanding the problem, really being able to tangibly see what is going on with reading and math. Um, and in Karnataka, uh, this was actually understood well by the government, thanks to the ASAR data, the Annual Status of Education Report data that was being generated generated through the survey. Uh, and the Teaching at the Right Level program, of course, uses a similar assessment. Uh, so then they were able to see kind of how they are doing uh, compared to the situation that was there prior to the program. 
I think the second very interesting point in Karnataka was choosing locations that would allow for senior level engagement. Uh, so the initial pilot locations for the program uh, were decided in a way that senior level officials could actually engage with the program on the ground. So, you know, often you hear from of people starting, you know, in a, in a remote place, does it really work there? Or, you know, we should go to a difficult area. All that is, of course, very, very important. Uh, but what really helped us in Karnataka was that right from the beginning, this was really driven by state level, senior level officials. And as a result, you had champions at the state level that were really driving the agenda. So it was not Pratham driving the agenda. It was the government uh, themselves. And how were they able to do this? Well, of course, it's with very careful capacity building, right? So thought of very carefully at each level what kind of capacity building is necessary. Uh, but as soon as we went into the implementation structures, making sure that there are leaders of practice that are being generated. So people from within the government system who are understanding the problem themselves, being trained, trying the approach themselves in the classroom before taking it forward. So often we, we feel that cascades aren't strong, don't necessarily work that well, but the reason it worked so well here, and you'll see this in many teaching at the right level programs, is that there is actual practice built into the process so that when you go to the next level and you have the questions about whether this works, is it relevant to my context, so I don't have this problem, you're speaking from firsthand experience uh, to help teachers or instructors sort of understand and take this forward. And then the last thing I'd like to mention about government buy-in and, and contribution to scale is learning and sharing. I think with every year of implementation, there was very careful you know, thought going into what are we learning, what information is coming out from the program, and not just at the beginning and start of a program cycle, but throughout the program cycle, not just from the Pratham side, but from within the government system. So having you know, this simple data, having dashboards, having these review processes really helped to be able to kind of understand what's working and what isn't, uh, so that year on year, the program could be strengthened. Pre-COVID, the program was uh, in about uh, 20 districts out of the 34 in the state and all schools in those districts. And this year, as schools are coming back post the pandemic, the government has taken a decision to go statewide. Uh, so that's about 30,000 schools uh, in all 34 districts. And this is really led by the government system uh, through the capacity uh, that has been built. Uh, so I'll pause there and happy to take any questions later if we have time. Thank you very much, Daviani. Uh, I hope that Ablai's audio is now working. Um, Ablai, if you are online, uh, please could you add anything on, on these points about learning and scaling? Uh, I'm not hearing Ablai. People in the background are working on our interpretation. I know he's unmuted. Uh, are others hearing? Okay. Um, there's no sound. Ablai. Ablai, I'm, I'm so sorry to do this. We're just going to have to stop uh, because we're not getting the audio. We're, we're really sorry to do this and, and we'll find another way to share your remarks um, with, with this group and hopefully have you on a future webinar. Um, very sorry to do this. Uh, so having heard a bit more from all of our panelists and from RTI, we'll now kickstart the discussion by turning to Laura Savage, our discussant, so Laura is the executive director of the International Education Funders Group. Previously, she was at FCDO as a senior education advisor and deputy head of education research. Uh, and she's a member of the advisory group that's um, helped to support the Learning at Scale study. Uh, thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. And thanks for having me here today. Um, I'll keep my comments short. I'm very aware we're, we're keen to get to Q&A. Um, but I wanna start by just saying how excited I was to be involved with this project at the very beginning um, and how excited I am now to be able to give examples that go beyond Kusome or 
the three that were listed in Louise Crouch's blog and, and paper of, of a couple of years ago, and to be able to um, finally have a list of, you know, of proven evidenced uh, programs that really can improve learning outcomes at the scale and uh, to some extent speed that, that uh, we've all been looking for. Um, this is something I often find myself being the negative person in the room, sort of hold on, hang on, you know, let's, uh, let's remember just how hard this is going to be. Um, and in a way, my, I've got kind of three reflections I'd like to work through today, each of which moves, I feel like we're a step forward in the positive uh, momentum, but each still drills home how difficult and how, you know, how much work went into uh, getting to this point. So my three points are around, they, they all start with an S. We like alliteration. Um, the first one is around selection. The second one is around success. And what does that look like? And the third one is around solutions. Um, the, the first and selection, and, and Matthew and Jonathan spoke to this at the start. The selection criteria for this uh, project, I think, uh, was set really carefully. And as part of the advisory group kind of grappling with them, I was struck by how difficult it was to find examples. And yes, I take the point, you know, Ben, 10 years ago, maybe we wouldn't have found any. But I certainly, as a funder then, took away the message to my peers in the global education space. In 10 years' time, we need to be able to give these guys, the researchers that come and ask us this question in 10 years' time, governments around the world, by multilateral funders, philanthropists, everyone, we need to have the examples ready to give. Um, and the, the piece that struck me the most from that selection criteria is that although I could, I could think of a lot of examples of scale, I couldn't think of a lot of examples that had data to evidence, even the data to evidence whether they'd worked at small scale before going to large scale. And so I think um, one of my big reflections related to selection is uh, the extent to which we believe that there is sufficient funding going into data and national data systems in particular that are going to enable us to answer those questions when they come to us in 10 years time. I, for one, am not convinced there's sufficient money going into data at the moment. It's the unsexy piece, but it is the essential piece. I also reflect as part of the selection on the type of programs that these are. And, you know, I think particularly in the slide that kind of comes up um, with the sort of map of where they are in the world, these are, there, there are particular characteristics that define these programs. You know, those that are funded, um, funded through uh, certain large global organizations, those that are supported with technical capacity uh, from firms based around the world. And I think that is, I think there, there is a potential to see in this a model that should be replicated. Um, and I'm interested to hear the panel's views on the diversity that lies behind that, that kind of characteristic, because I think there is quite a lot of, of diversity that lies behind it. And indeed, um, the reflections on incentives and, and uh, uh, trends that you see in terms of the, the anecdotal evidence that's coming through on the, on the large scale uh, interventions that are, that are being implemented now, that didn't make the bar here, but that might look a bit different. So past uh, selection, the next uh, reflection point I have is success. And I think the the, the S on the title here was scale, and that is the success criteria that we're looking at and measuring against. But time and again, the question of sustainability came up in discussion today. And I think there's an important reflection on the interconnection between scale and sustainability. We can't divorce those things. We shouldn't divorce those things. And um, while it is fantastic to see learning outcomes proven at scale through this mix of interventions, I hope we can get more out of the data and I hope we can keep the conversation going about sustainability. And some of that came out, I think, in the last few comments, Betty and Diviani in particular, you talked about co-creation, you talked about the importance of, you know, locally led engagement, ownership and so forth. I'd love to see the evidence base on some of that stuff coming out of, of um, more uh, as we go through learning about education interventions that, that do result in sustainable change. Indeed, I would love, and this is not a direct pitch to any funder in the room, I would love to see more research on these eight in particular track down the line so that we are getting to the point of understanding what makes sustainability, what makes sustainable change. I think we have our hypotheses, but I don't think we've got sufficient data on that yet. Um, the other thing I think uh, I, I unpack in terms of success is the, the, the term scale itself. And I don't want to be the kind of this, 
you know, the provocative person in the room, but, but should we be aiming for scale? And I'm not sitting here saying we shouldn't be aiming that every child in the, in the world should be able to read a basic sentence by 10. Again, that's something I, I think we need to underline whenever we're talking to anyone outside the education sector of how basic our goals are here. But I do worry sometimes that when we say scale, everyone thinks big, everyone thinks go, everyone thinks, you know, and that can very easily translate into a cut and paste here. You know, we, we've got this thing that works. Let's go and do it big. I would be really interested to hear a little more from the panelists on the extent to which these ideas and these approaches that, were, that are laid out here, the commonalities that we see across them, to what extent did you see local adaptation and iteration? And when I say local, I mean really local, I mean at school level, I mean at community level. So to what extent was there flex in implementation that allowed and enabled these particular big trends and big interventions to be made appropriate for particular context? Because it feels to me that that is a practice that can contribute to both sustainability and scale together. And the third point I want to make linked to that is this idea of solutions. And I think one of my biggest reflections from this whole project is that, and, and Ben kind of, kind of made this point earlier, but I do want to come back to it, that um, there are really clear findings here. And that's fantastic that we can take away. But I think I value the research as much if not more than the findings on what works because we we need to be careful that we're not producing lists of things that will automatically be taken as go fund implement bang it'll work as Ben said earlier I think um, one of the key things that I take away here is the importance of research and data as we go as Devyani said the feedback loops from data that feed into Understanding as we implement, understanding as we go, how and why, moving beyond what works, but thinking about how, why, and for whom, for which groups of children, uh, uh, who learned the most, who didn't learn. And, and I think um, I'd be really interested to understand more about the kind of layers of nuance that we have in the data here and that we could produce going forward. I think finally, in terms of thinking about solutions, and, and I don't like the idea of solutions. Um, but I think we do need to think, sort of dig into what worked here by asking questions of capacity and capability. And I think that sort of brings me back round to the first point and the types of interventions that we talked about here. So what are the reflections on, on how the models of support that we've seen as the funding and other types of support that have been given to these interventions, what reflections do we have for building sustainable change in the ecosystems that we're trying to support here? I'll stop there and look forward to more questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Laura. Lot, lots of great points to unpack there. Uh, we're going to move on to, to audience Q&A. We're going to go a few minutes over the scheduled time. But of course, the recording will be available for anyone that has a hard stop at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Um, I have questions, but there's quite a few that have come in from the audience members. So I'm going to uh, paraphrase a question that's come in, question and comments that have come in from, from quite a few people to, to start the Q&A. Um, so a few people are noting that these are large scale programs that have external funding in the form of aid and donor funding. Uh, and that's really allowed the programs to focus on a strong quality of implementation. And the questions are around, have the programs considered what the role of the donors has been? What happens when the programs are transitioned over to government? Uh, what kinds of things do these programs need in order to sustain their gains? Uh, and does what's required? Does uh, transitioning over to government require good governance in the country? Has that, has that become an issue? So lots of questions around funding streams and um, sustainability, of course. So I don't know that we'll get to everyone, but if anyone wants to address that question, um, please let me know. Please wave a hand if you're uh, interested in that. So we'll start with Nuruddin and then Deviani. Yeah, thank you. I, I, working with governments is very interesting. Like I mentioned in my earlier submission that uh, you make sure that uh, budget is always about budget that the reading activity 
is reflected in the budget of the state and has its own charge code. That's one thing. So year in, year out, it gets budgeted for whether you are there or you are not there. The other level is to ensure that capacity is developed within the government to be able to implement. And so that means all levels of capacity that is required, uh, teacher training, uh, management of training, uh, facilitators, uh, book production, every level must be developed. And so we had uh, technical working groups of different government functionaries that handled the, the, the different areas of the project. That way, uh, the co-creation thing was ensured. And when we, leave, when we left, uh, they're doing that now. And they are supporting the, the two states that started with, for example, Bauchi State is supporting Yobe State, that is a Bezda project uh, state, to be able to uh, stand on its own feet. So creating a mass within the government and outside of the government uh, for, the, for, for, for supporting reading, I think is very crucial uh, for the continuity and for government to be able to stand on its own. With lots of emphasis on co-creation in, in a couple of the programs that we've heard about. Uh, Deviani? Yep, thanks so much, Rita. I think um, the, the interesting part uh, of, of most of Pratham's work at scale with government in India, which many people don't often know, is that all of the core programmatic costs are taken care of by government. So it's really about making sure that costs are as low as possible so that right from the beginning, right from pilot stage, you're thinking about scale, right? And I think this was very important in Karnataka as well, really from you know the first phase of the pilot, which is just three districts, making sure that materials, training, monitoring, measurement, review, all of these costs, any additional costs were borne by the government. The only thing we brought to the table really was our own technical support, which was of course funded by you know, various multiple donors who are supporting Pratham's teams. Um, and this really prepared us for this transition phase, right? So because you're relying uh, you know, so much on government leveraging their own resources, not just human resources, but also financial resources, there's a lot of buy-in and commitment right from the beginning. And that makes this transition process easier because there's only so much technical support that Pratham can give uh, on our own shoulders, right? It's really about building that capacity within the government system, which we were very conscious about right from the beginning. And because we had that you know, practical hands-on approach to capacity building, everybody's involved in the mentoring, the review processes, looking at the data, that really prepares the system well to then take it forward. So today we're in a very good position with the government, right? They feel confident as a system, even though bureaucracy has changed significantly in the past five years, it's in the fifth year of the program now going to full state uh, scale. Uh, the commitment and the capacity is still very much there within the government system because that capacity has been built at all different levels. So I think that's those are some of the learnings, especially from the Karnataka example. Of course, things may look different in other country contexts, but I think in India, we've learned basically this is one of the best ways to be able to work uh, with the government system to ensure that they're able to scale and sustain. Thank you, Deviani. I saw Betty wanted to comment on this, so we'll turn to Betty and then Ben from the presentation, and, and then we'll move to the next question. Thanks, Betty. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Rita. For Ghana, I think, as I said before, we are very embedded in the, in the system, in the government, the Ministry of Education. What we're getting excited about at the moment is that uh, we have an oversight steering committee, which I spoke about, and the uh, chairman of the uh, oversight committee, the deputy minister of education is very, very much interested in what we're doing. They have seen the results and they are starting to look at how they can scale up to all the other schools. We are in 5,000 schools, there are about 20,000 plus schools. So I think the discussions are just starting uh, and we are considering how they're going to scale up 
to us, I think is a big achievement for this project. And we're really hoping that the discussion will continue and then it will be embedded in the system and scaled up. So every, every school, every early grade school in Ghana will use uh, the learning's approach to reading. So for us, I think this is where we're, we're, we're putting our hope and we, we believe that once we cross that level, the materials will be really embedded in the system. And as it has been said, once it is embedded in the system, there will be a funding line for it and materials will have to be uh, bought from the schools to use. So thank you. Thanks, Betty. Over to Ben. Yes, thanks, everybody. Um, my quick comment just comes from my experience doing data collection for the study in Tanzania. And one of the things that uh, program participants, which were district officers, um, as well as national level officers at two different levels in Tanzania, really spoke to was their experience of the Equip T Tanzania program being different than previous ones with respect to planning and budgeting. So the, the Equip T program shifted over time, but by the end of the program, they had an explicit amount of uh, district level and national level engagement um, with the system on the nuts and bolts of implementation. And I think that that has, you know, hearing that from them really spoke to the importance of obviously the national level agreements, the minister, et cetera, but the daily discussions with officers on the ground as they're planning, going forward for implementation on training, really differentiated Equip T from other programs that are, have tried to scale up in, in the past. Thanks, Rita. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try one more time for Able to make comments. We think his audio is sorted, but Let's just take a few seconds. Probably it may just be that your microphone is not connected. We still can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, Ablai. Um, next, I want to come to a question that, that Laura asked. We have some related audience questions as well. She asked about whether the panelists saw local adaptation and innovation as part of the program. Um, in addition to that, perhaps related, how have the communities themselves, parents and communities otherwise been uh, involved in these programs? So Nurudin, do you have any comments on, on that local adaptation community involvement in Nigeria? Um, I do, I do. It's very interesting that um, there are crop and there are increasing individuals that are not even mainstream educationists that have decided due to the activities that have happened in reading uh, that the project has done that are now coming up with their own a phonics-based reading approach. I'll give an example. Maybe you can check them online. It's called Just Montessori. There's another one called Reading Corner. These are individuals that decide to use our materials and come back to say that um, they have added to it their own um, expertise and they are using it in local communities with kids and they're happy that the kids are improving in their reading competences. And this is everywhere now. I give another example. Uh, the project worked closely with the um, Center for Nigeria Reading Research and Development uh, that is based in BUK. And in the last three years, um, we supported the center to stand on its own and have been holding yearly uh, reading conference, annual reading conference, and one of that just concluded last year. And the first one that they were able to do on their own without external support was just the one we finished last week. So I think that uh, there's a lot of local initiatives around reading that has really sprung up. And uh, this needs to even be researched into in terms of uh, who are these people and um, what are the successes, what successes are they really accomplishing um, in the different places where they work? At least I know like three of them, individuals that go into communities, use our materials and come back to tell us that uh, it's really making an uh, impact and added to it, of course. 
Thank you. Thanks, Nerudine. And I'm sure there's so much rich discussion we could have about everything that happened in all of these programs. Um, anything else that anyone uh, really wants to highlight in terms of local adaptation, innovation, and community involvement? Perhaps we can, I'm sure everyone is eager to know what other questions are coming in. Um, here's another question from um, Ariana at FCDO in, in Malawi. Are we not picking up lessons from programs similar by design? So this relates to Laura, Laura Savage's point about what gets evaluated, what gets included. Um, for example, large contracts from other donors were large programs from donors uh, that didn't work different from, from the programs that are included in, in the study. Yeah, I think Rita, it's, I mean, it's a great question. It's something we've been talking about a lot on our team is, you know, we, we talked about the similarities, right? And there, I think are two aspects to that, right? One is we are therefore highlighting the things that were focused, that were funded similarly. So six of the eight programs being primarily USAID funded and USAID tends to fund a certain type of program and therefore by design, we are saying these are the things that work because those were the things, right, that were that were funded there. But, but I think, and Ben made this point earlier, that part of it is that these were also the programs that had evidence of impact, right? So, so it may be that there are other programs that are using different approaches that are impactful that we just don't have the evidence of impact. And so that in itself is an important part of this, right? And it goes back to Laura's point about the value of the research itself, right? So we, we do want to see more and more um, of these initiatives, whether they're government led or from other donors um, having uh, the types of data that would allow us to assess uh, their, their effectiveness in the same way that we have from, from these programs. Um, but we've also talked a fair amount about, yeah, what is it that ineffective programs are doing? Because even within the, if we just stick with the USAID sphere of these programs, there are a lot of programs that are being funded that aren't having these impacts, right? And so that's kind of what we were saying at the beginning on the, the idea is understanding how to implement effectively less than trying to understand what are these like, you know, new or different things that we can be doing, right? It's, it because it may be that there are two programs that are following some of the same exact designs, but it's working in one context, it's not working in another. And I think that's where you need to look at these things a little more holistically, right? And so trying to understand from our side, the instructional practice, instructional support, and systems all as a comprehensive model allows us to understand how do we implement each of these components as part of a big thing that, that we think may actually um, be effective and just picking and choosing small aspects of it um, may, not, uh, may not ultimately get you there. I think that's a Pretty complete answer. I'm just looking at um, Matthew or Ben to see if they have anything to add. Um, but at this time, we are over time. So I think we are going to stop with that. Um, thanks to the speakers for staying on and for taking the time today to be part of this conversation. Thanks very much to, to all of the uh, organizers of the event at CGD and RTI. Um, as Jonathan said at the beginning, there's an interim report out, there's a full report coming down the line. There are future webinars that will discuss these topics even more in depth. Um, so definitely a lot more to come on learning at scale. So please, please stay tuned. Please look out from RTI and CGD for more on this topic. Uh, and thanks very much to RTI for this work and for starting this uh, discussion on, on very important topics that are being widely discussed in our sector today. Thank you, everyone.